Well, hey guys, welcome to Virtual Band of Brothers. I'm glad you're uh, tuning in to see this with us. Um, we're using a new streaming technology that you're probably not aware of. It's called ICU, and it stands for ICU. I see you right now, I can see you. We have a technology that lets me see into your home, and let me just say, some of you guys are way underdressed. It's, it's really inappropriate, so by next week, let's get your act together, okay? Get dressed, take a shower, come on. I, I can't take much of this, but I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're streaming with us. And I know this is a little weird, it's a little odd. It's strange for me to be doing it this way, but I'm glad we have the technology and we have the team here at Christ Chapel that makes this all possible. If I have a certain glow about me, it's because my wife, Julie, arrived home today from Ethiopia. I finally got her home after 20 days away and I was glad to, to see her and then made my way up here so I could record this for you. So let me pray for us and we're gonna jump into chapters 17 and 18 of the book of Judges. Father, we come to you this day and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the fact that even in the midst of all that we're going through and the uncertainty of these days that we have a certainty in you, your love for us, your greatness, your goodness, your sovereignty, that Father, as I say so often, you're not up in heaven wringing your hands, you weren't caught off guard, you're fully aware, aware of everything that's going on in this world right here, right now, and in our lives. And we just pray, Father, as we dive into this book this morning, that you would speak to us, that you would guide us, that you would direct us, uh, and that, Father, we would be changed by what we hear. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you for these men. Thank you for their families. And Father, we ask that you would speak to us today. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, we're gonna be looking at chapters 17 and 18. And uh, next week, we'll wrap this whole study up with the last three chapters of the book. As usual, I've given these lessons pretty long titles. And this one is not a short one. And it's based on something we've heard over and over again as we've studied this book. And it's everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that is never more true than in these closing five chapters of the book. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. And we're gonna dig into that a little bit deeper and see just how significant that really is as we look at these two chapters in particular. The one thing that jumps out at me in these closing chapters is this idea of the godly. And we've talked about this a little bit over the last weeks. One of the things that we have to keep in mind when we study this book is that it involves the people of Israel. Okay, we're not talking about some pagan nation. We're not talking about lost people. We're talking about the people of God. We're talking about the Israelites. That's what the book is all about. And these are the chosen people of God. Again, these are not pagans. These are people who have been chosen by God, set apart by God, who have been blessed by God, and yet we see them, them acting in ways that really don't fit. They don't seem to match who they are as God's people. We know from earlier in the book that the people had a habit of doing things the wrong way, doing what was right in their own eyes. And this goes all the way back to Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 19, verses five through six, it says, now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Now see, this is something that God said to the people of Israel when they had just come out of captivity in Egypt. He tells them, if you will obey me, if you will keep my covenant, you're gonna to be to me a special nation, a special people, a treasured possession. And they were supposed to live set apart lives. But how had they done? Well, we've seen over and over again that they let, tended to li live godless lives. Now, what I mean by that is not just that they were doing ungodly things, and they were, they were living as if God dis didn't exist. So their lives were marked by godlessness, idolatry, immorality, injustice. But the real sad part of their whole story is the fact that they acted as if they had no God. Now they had all kinds of gods, but as far as Yahweh was concerned, they treated him as if he was the redheaded stepchild. Uh, he didn't really exist, he didn't really have any power, and they put more faith and hope in these other gods of the Canaanites. And we see that pattern over and over again. That's why we see in the closing chapters, these last five chapters, four different times we're gonna hear this phrase. In those days, there was no king in Israel. 
everyone did what was, what? Right in their own eyes. And as we said weeks and weeks ago, what that means is they think they're doing the right thing, the righteous thing, the good thing, but they're not. They're doing the wrong thing. They're doing the bad thing. And part of this is tied to this phrase, there was no king in Israel. Now, what's really significant about that is when we read it, we tend to think, well, yeah, they didn't have a king. A king. They, they didn't have a Saul. They didn't have a David, a Solomon. And while that's partly what's inferred here, there's something far deeper going on in this verse than meets the eye. And it has a whole lot more to do with God. You see, God was supposed to be their king. But over and over again, ever since they left Egypt, all the way through the wilderness, and even now, as they've gotten into the land and conquered most of the land, they really didn't treat God as their king. And they weren't satisfied with God as their king. This has been repeated all throughout their lives, over years and years, in various generations, and we've seen it as we've studied through these various judges and how they tried to lead the people of God, but they did it poorly. So not only are the people not treating God as a king, even these judges were not treating God as a king. In fact, many of them wanted to be king. They wanted to be more than just a judge. They wanted to rule the people like an earthly king. So this is a problem that's been going on. And we, we saw a couple of weeks ago that there's a point in time coming in the story of the Israelites where they're gonna come to Samuel. And Samuel is going to be the last of the judges. And they're gonna come to him and they're gonna say, you're about to die and we don't like the quality of your sons, and so we want a king. And they're gonna demand that he find them a king like all the other nations. And he doesn't like that. But God's gonna go to him and say, hey, it's all right. And he tells Samuel something important. He says, they have rejected me from being their king. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me for being their king. They don't want God, Yahweh, as their king. And so what's gonna happen is this is gonna get even worse in the sense that God is going to say, you've rejected me. You've rejected God as your king. You don't want me to be your king. You would rather have an earthly king instead of me. And really that's the story of the book. They're demanding that Samuel, the last judge, give them a king. But see, the whole time God was to be their king. He was to be their sovereign. He was to be their ruler. And see, this idea of everyone doing what was right in their own eyes, which is directly tied to them wanting a king other than God, is the whole story of the book of Judges. It's what the book is about. And we've seen it week after week after week through various judges going from not so good to the worst. They didn't want God as their king. So you could almost take the inverse of this. When, when we read that everyone did what was right in their own eyes, the opposite is just as true and it's even more important. They're really doing that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Everyone was doing evil from whose perspective? God's perspective. See, it doesn't really matter whether they think what they're doing is right. What matters is, does God think it's right? And we see in these verses that God is saying, no, it's evil in my eyes. It's the opposite of what I expect of my people. They're not living set apart lives. They're not living as who I want them to be. And the truth is, it says everyone, right? It's all inclusive. And we're gonna see in these two chapters today that nothing could be more true. Everyone from the top to the bottom, the rich, the poor, are doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord. It's widespread, it's rampant, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. And that's a sad indictment when we go back and consider that this is talking about the chosen people of God. You see, as we look at these two chapters, verses, uh, chapters 17 through 21 as a whole, but in particular, chapters 17 and 18, this thing really exposes itself in a grand way. And we're gonna see it in great detail as we dig into these chapters. Starting in chapter 17, all the way through the closing chapter, chapter 21, this phrase is repeated four different times. We see it in chapter 17, verse six. We see it in chapter 21, verse 25. Now, what's interesting is those are mirrors. They're, they're exact replicas of one another. And this is what's called in literature an inclusio. That simply means it's like a parenthesis. These are the brackets on the parentheses. 
They start chapter 17, they end chapter 21. And everything in between supports these statements. So they're like a parentheses that is supported by the information in between. So everything in 17 through 21 draws this same conclusion. There was no king. They weren't treating God like a king and they were all doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so you see it supported over and over again. So when it says in those days, and it says it four times in five chapters, what are we talking about here? Now, the natural conclusion, the logical conclusion would be to say, well, it's talking about the end of Samson's life, the period of the judges, but that's not what's going on. And this is really important for us, for us to understand when we study these last five chapters, because they're not in chronological order. Now, at the, the death of Samson that Chase talked about last week takes place somewhere around 1075 BC. So when he dies, this is the end of the book of Judges. But what's gonna happen is Samuel, the author of the book of Judges, is gonna take us backwards in time. He's gonna rewind the tape. It's almost like a flashback in a movie. He's gonna take us back in time and show us the condition of Israel before the first judge, Othniel, shows up on the scene. So we're gonna rewind and go all the way back to 1375 BC. Now, if you were in week one, we know that what happened was at that period of time, Joshua was still alive, but he's elderly, he's dying and he gives a last charge to the people of Israel before they finish conquering the land. And he tells them, finish the job. And then he's gonna die. And then we're gonna see, before the first judge shows up, Othniel, we're gonna get a glimpse into what was life like in Israel before Othniel showed up. And that's what these last five chapters are all about. So we're going back in time. It's the time of Joshua's death, it's the time when the people are supposed to be conquering the remainder of the Canaanites living in the land and finish taking their inheritance from the Canaanites. And we're gonna see that there's a tie in between Judges chapter 17 that we're gonna look at today and Judges chapter one. What's going on here? Well, if you go all the way back to verse 34 of chapter one, it says the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country. Now, if you remember in chapter one, there's this kind of litany of things going on where Judah is conquering various people groups, Canaanites, and casting them out of the land. They're having success because they sought the will of God. But then they get to a point where they see people with iron chariots and they fail to finish the job. And then they begin to fail at casting out these people. And then you see each of the tribes failing. And here we have the tribe of Dan failing to take over the land allotted to them by God and they're cast out. They're pushed out of the land that was supposed to be theirs, their inheritance. And that's gonna be part of what we see in the story of the people of Dan in chapter 17 and 18. So Judges 17 and 18 is gonna tell us about what happens to the tribe of Dan, one of the tribes of Israel. And what's really interesting and it's gonna be even clearer as we get into next week the tribe of Dan, which is one of the smallest tribes, is going to end up re representing the northern kingdom of Israel. If you know anything about the history of Israel, at the end of Solomon's reign, he's taken on way too many concubines and way too many wives against the law of God, and he has begun to worship their gods. And God's gonna take his kingdom and he's gonna split it in half. And he's gonna end up with 10 tribes in the north called Israel and two tribes in the south called Judah. The 10 tribes in the north, part of them are the Danites. And you're gonna see how they come about and how they end up in the north in the first place. And it's not by the will of God. And then you're gonna see in Judges 19 through 21, we're gonna look at another small tribe, the Benjamites, who lived in the south and they come to represent the southern kingdom of Judah. See, God is working behind the scenes in ways that we can't see. It's a lot of what we're talking about in these days as we see all the things happening around us. God is at work. We don't fully understand. We don't get it. We don't even necessarily like it. But see, his ways are not our ways. And he is working behind the scenes and we just know we don't know exactly what the outcome is gonna be. The same thing is true here. The Danites don't know what the future holds. The Benjamites don't know what the future holds, but God does. 
And so we're gonna see that as we dig into these two chapters. So this is the timeline of the book of Judges. But remember, we're going back in time. We're going back to 1375 BC. And that brings us to chapter 17, verse one. Here's what it says. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1100 pieces of silver that were taken from you about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver is with me. Then he goes on and says, she says, blessed be my son by the Lord. She pronounces a blessing on him. And he restored the 1100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son. Now catch this, to make a carved image and a metal image. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took the 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image. Now let's just stop there. What in the world is going on? Now these two chapters are packed with narrative and we're not gonna have a time to go back and read it all. So what I've decided to do is I'm gonna teach you using a flannel graph. Now, some of you older guys know exactly what a flannel graph is. I've talked about it before. When I grew up going to Sunday school, I was taught using flannel graphs. It was a piece of felt with a scene on it. And the teacher would take these cutouts of characters and stick them on the flannel and they would stay there. It was magic. It was high tech. It's the way we learn Bible stories. So that's what I'm gonna to use today to teach you about this story in chapter 17 and 18. So this is a guy named Micah. Micah stole some money and he stole it from his mother, 1,100 pieces of silver, which was a lot of coin, which means she was obviously a wealthy woman. He steals this money, but then his mother out of anger pronounces a curse on the thief, not knowing who it was. Well, he's scared by the curse, so he returns the money to his mother. And she, in order to counteract the curse, pronounces a blessing. And she dedicates the 1100 pieces of silver to Yahweh. Sounds good. Sounds like the right thing to do. But as we go on in the story, it tells us that she took 200 pieces of silver and she gives it to a silversmith and he makes an idol. Now, already we see this story going south, right? Not only did she take some of the money, give it to a silversmith who made an idol, and I know this is gold and she gave him silver, but it's the best I could do. But here's the key. What did she do with the rest of the money? She dedicated it all to God, but she only took $200 and gave it to the silversmith. So she kept some of the money. So there's all kinds of things going wrong in this story. Well, it gets worse. Then comes this guy. He's a Levite. He's described in the story as a young Levite. And this young Levite, and that's a problem because it probably means that he's too young to serve as a Levite. He's not yet of age. You had to be 30 years of age to begin serving as a Levite, as a priest. But he shows up in Ephraim and he shows up at the house of Micah and Micah sees him and he thinks this is a godsend. This is a priest. He's a Levite. And why that's important is because Micah had taken the idol along with some other images that he had, put him in his home, made a shrine and made his son his priest. Again, everything about this story is wrong. Well, now here comes this Levite. The Levites were set apart by God to serve in the tabernacle. They were to be his priests. They belonged to him. Now, one of the other things wrong in this story that you may miss is the fact that it says that he had been sojourning in Bethlehem. Now, the Levites were the only tribe that weren't, weren't given land. They didn't get an allotment. They were to live in 48 different cities scattered throughout the tribes of Israel. So they had no land, but they had cities to live in, Levitical cities. This guy should not have been sojourning in Bethlehem. It was not one of those cities. Also where Micah lived in Ephraim, it was not one of the cities. So this Levite, a too young, not ready and of age to be a priest, and has not been living in the designated places that God had for Levites. So once again, everything about the story is wrong. Well, Micah sees this guy and he decides to make him his priest, replaces his son with this young man. And this young man agrees. Micah says, I'll pay you. 
I'll give you clothes. I'll give you a salary. I'll give you a place to live. If you'll only serve as my priest in my shrine using my idols. What's wrong with that? He's a Levite. He's dedicated to God. And now he's going to serve this man in a place that God didn't designate. And he's going to serve gods that weren't Yahweh. So you see, 1375, long before Othniel shows up, things in Israel are not good. And it's gonna get worse as we go through this story. So the Levite went in, lived with Micah, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now, that I, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. Again, do you see what's wrong with this? Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. He thinks these decisions are godly. He's got a house full of idols used with money that was stolen that his mother dedicated to Yahweh, but 200 pieces of silver were used to build an idol. And now he's got a Levite working for him who is totally out of the will of God. And yet he says, God's gonna prosper me. And he never could have been more wrong than when he made that statement. So what do we do? We go forward into chapter 18 and we're gonna see the Danites come into the scene. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Again, this is the story of these last five chapters, 1375 BC, before the first judge shows up on the scene. We've already seen Micah, his mother, and this Levite doing what's right in their own eyes. It says, in those days, the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. For until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. Now, this is a misstatement. I'm not saying that Samuel is writing a falsehood. I'm saying it could easily be misread as falsehood. It tells us that they had no inheritance, but we know that they did because this is the land they should have been given. It's right here to the left on the Mediterranean sea coast. They had been given allotted land like all the other tribes. But as we saw in chapter one, verse 34, they had failed to kick out the Amorites and they had left the land to the Amorites. It's not that they didn't have an inheritance. It's that they never did do what God called them to do. They were disobedient. They were unfaithful. They were lacking in faith. And so what do they do? We're gonna see in this, this chapter that they're going to begin looking for a new land and they're gonna end up going from Dan, the land that had been awarded to them by God, all the way to the north, to the far reaches of the kingdom, to the land of promise. And they're gonna settle in a land called Laish and they're gonna rename it Dan. But see, this was not what God gave to them. This is not what God promised to them. This was not their inheritance, but it didn't matter to them. They were gonna do what was right in their own eyes. So the people go send five spies out to look for a new place to live. They send five men to go scour the land and find some place that doesn't belong to one of the other tribes where they could live, which means they've got to go to the far north beyond the, the borders of the other 11 tribes. And what's interesting in the story is these five spies show up and they discover the Levite who's living with Micah. And by this time, he's got the priestly robes, he's got an ephod, he looks like a priest, he sounds like a priest. As a matter of fact, the passage tells us they recognized his voice. That didn't mean they knew him from before, they recognize him doing his priestly thing. And so they approach him and they wonder what he's doing there as a Levite, because even they know Levites shouldn't be living, living in Ephraim. What are you doing here? And the Levite tells him his story and they're intrigued by it. And so what they do is they ask him, hey, you're a priest, you've got gods, we need some advice. And so they ask him, inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Now this is a fascinating statement. This young man is telling them a lie, but he's also telling them the truth. What do I mean? Well, he's telling them that God is in favor. At least that's the way they interpret it. Hey, God's on your side. God's okay with us. Keep doing what you're doing. 
But notice what he says, and this is critical. He says, the journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. See, that part's right. God was watching. God saw everything that they were planning to do. But here's the deal. God wasn't in favor of it. And God was going to punish them for it. See, God is watching. God knows. God didn't put his seal of approval on this decision. But the Danites are going to go with this. And these men are going to end up leaving Micah behind. And they go on their journey and we're told that they go all the way to the north and they discover a land called Laish. And in this land, they find all kinds of bounty and they find a people who live peaceful lives and they seem to be protected. And they also seem like an easy target. And so these men go all the way back home to their clan, the tribe of Dan, and they tell them, we found this land and it's a wonderful land. It's a rich land. It's an abundant land. And not only that, God's with us. Let's go take it. But see, they were wrong. God wasn't on their side. But 600 of the Danites, fully armed, head towards Laish. And on their way, they arrive at Micah's house and they meet the priest, the Levite. And they talk to him and they decide, not only are we going to talk to you, we're going to take you and we're gonna take your idols and you're gonna go with us to be our priest. So what's going on here? Once again, we see everything wrong with this story and it goes on and on over and over again. Every character in these chapters is doing what was right in their own eyes. Look what it says. And when these went to Micah's house, and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, what are you doing? In other words, he's like, whoa, 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 wait. This is Micah's house. I'm his priest. These are his idols. You can't do this, but they're gonna do it. They're gonna take what they want. And they said to him, keep quiet, put your hand on your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be priest to the house of one man or to be priest to a tribe and clan of Israel. And look what happens. And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and he went along with them. What does this tell you about this priest? This guy has no allegiance to anyone or anything. He has no allegiance to Yahweh. He has no allegiance to Micah. And he drops Micah like a hot potato and he goes with these men and he becomes their priest, and he takes Micah's gods. See, once again, everyone is doing what was right in their own eyes. And the story goes on and says that when Micah finds out that his Levi has left and he's taken all of his gods and ransacked his temple, he chases after them. But he's no match for 600 armed Danites, and he returns home empty-handed. And what's really fascinating about this is that Micah, catch this, Micah stole 1,100 pieces of silver from his own mother. Then he returns it out of fear of a curse. His mother takes part of that loot and makes an idol out of it. And now that idol, that very silver that Micah stole from his mother has now been stolen from him in the form of an idol. See, everyone is getting their just desserts. Everyone's getting what they deserve because God will not be mocked. But the story goes on. The 600 men leave and they go to Laish, their priest in tow and their idols with him. And it says, the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him. And they came to Laish to a people quiet and unsuspecting, struck them with the edge of the sword and they burned the city with fire. You see, it's getting worse and worse. They come upon these unsuspecting people who had done nothing to deserve this. This was not ordained by God. This was not land that, that was their inheritance. And they wipe out an entire city. They just put them to death. And then it tells us that they take over the city and they rebuild the city. It says the people of Dan set up the carved images for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. And once again, there's so much packed into these verses. The Danites steal the priest and his idols. 
They go to the north and they attack a land that was not ordained by God to attack. It was not land that belonged to them. And yet they kill these people. They wipe out the whole town. They rename the town Dan after their own tribe. And then what do they do? They set up these idols. They set up their own priests along with the Levite and they began to worship false gods. And what's interesting about that story is that years and years later, when the tribes split, when the Northern kingdom becomes Israel and the Southern kingdom becomes Judah, in Israel, they will set up idols once again, golden calves in Dan, and they will worship them there, keeping the people from going down to worship in Jerusalem. You see, this sin is going to continue. This sin is gonna have a long shelf life and it's gonna affect generation after generation of Israelites, not just the Danites, but all the other tribes of the Northern Kingdom. You see, it says that this is gonna last until the day of the captivity of the land. This idolatry of Dan and the idolatry of the Northern tribes is gonna continue all the way until God sends the Assyrians to attack Israel and take it captive. See, this is gonna go on for centuries. All these sins are gonna have, again, a long shelf life. They're going to replicate themselves. They're gonna grow exponentially. You know, as we hear the news and we hear about this virus, one of the fears we have is that it, it grows exponentially. It's not a mathematical growth, it's an exponential growth. It doubles, it, it grows so fast. That's what's going on in this story. And you can see it happening right before your eyes. The sins of one man, Micah, have already multiplied themselves to such a degree that entire tribe is now affected. And we're gonna see years later, centuries later, an entire nation is impacted. Well, what's wrong with this whole story? Everything. Everything we've just covered in this very short period of time is wrong. And one of the things we have to remember is that when this story was read during the period of the king, see Samuel wrote this for the people living during the kingship period, during the reigns of Saul and David and Solomon. When they read these stories, it jumped out at them and they could see that something was wrong. They could look back and see just how bad things were in Israel before the first judge came. Everything was doing what was right in their own eyes. And they were doing it because they didn't honor God as their king. So everything is wrong. Let's just go back. Mike is a thief. That's how the story starts. His mother is what? Syncretistic. That just simply means she's worshiping Yahweh, but she's obviously okay with worshiping other gods. She dedicated the money to Yahweh, but took $200 of it and she gave it to a silversmith to make an idol to a false god. She's secretistic. We see that Micah proves to be completely idolatrous. He adds to this image and has graven images and an ephod and he turns his house into a shrine and his son into, into a priest and then he hires this Levite to become a priest. He is sold out. He is canonized to the nth degree. We see the Levite's totally disobedient, right? He's practicing as a priest and he's too young to be one yet. We also see that he's not living in a Levitical city. He's out of bounds. He's not living where God ordained for him to live. He's also made, motivated by greed and gain, all for personal gain. Isn't it amazing that as soon as these Danites show up, he drops everything and goes with them. Again, no allegiance to Micah, but also no allegiance to Yahweh. And he abandons his God for false gods. And here's the worst thing. He turns the people's hearts against Yahweh. And then in the end, Micah mistakes this priest as the hand of God, the blessing of God. Remember what he said? Now that I've got this priest, I've got God's hand all over me. You see, sometimes we misread what we think are God's blessings. And that's what Micah was doing. When this priest showed up on his doorstep, he thought it was the hand of God, the blessing of God. But see guys, we've got to stay in touch with the will of God. We got to know what God wants. What has God decreed? And he should have known this priest had no business being there. 
He should have known that this priest was too young to act as a priest. He should have known not to steal money from his own mother. He should have known not to take this idol and put it in his home and worship it. He should have known all of these things. Why? Because he was a member of the family of God. He was one of the chosen people of God. But if you're gonna reject God as your king, you'll end up doing what you think is right, which is what Micah has done, what his mother has done, what the Levite has done, what the Danites have done. And it's all through the story. So the Danites, what about them? They rejected the, the land that God had given them. They couldn't conquer the Amorites. And so they just walked away. And yet God had said, this is your land. It's your allotment. It is your blessing. It is abundant. It is rich. It's on the Mediterranean Sea, fishing, shipping. They would have been blessed had they lived there. But rather than take what God had given them, they went and searched for what they wanted. And again, they're out of the will of God and they're doing what's right in their own eyes. And that's a dangerous place for any child of God to be, operating outside of the will of God opposed to the will of God, doing what's right in your eyes, but that which is evil in his eyes. They're also idolatrous. That's pretty clear, right? They take the Levitical priest and they take all of the idols and they take them with them and they worship them and they set them up in Dan. And that will continue, as I said earlier, for generations to come. It's addictive, it's infectious. Like the virus, it spreads and it's gonna to spread to all of their descendants and it's gonna spread throughout the, 11, the, the 10 tribes that represent the Northern Kingdom of Israel. See, they're out of touch with God. The very fact that they said, God is with us. When Micah gave, him, gave them that false word that go, God is watching you, God sees. And they went back and told their own people, hey, we can do this. We can take Laish. We can conquer these people because God is with us. No, he wasn't. Did they succeed? Yes. Was that God's blessing? No. See, you can have victory even outside of the blessings of God, the will of God. You can accomplish things that you confuse as God's blessing, but they're not. You have to know God's will. And to know God's will, guess what? You got to know God. And they had long ago forgotten who God really was. And they ended up becoming thieves, idolaters, and ultimately murderers, wiping out an entire city that God didn't ordain them to wipe out. So again, what's wrong with this story? Everything. They all were doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So one thing that I wanna kind of close with, and it's gonna wrap up this lesson today, Look at what it says. Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests of the tribe of the Danites. Well, who is this? Who's Jonathan? We haven't heard this name mentioned in the story. It's interesting that Samuel, like any good author, has kind of held out some information from us. Remember, when we met the Levite, we, didn't, we weren't given a name. We, we were just told he was a young Levite. But here in chapter 18, in verse 30, we're told his name. His name's Jonathan. Why is that significant? We're also told that he's the son of Moses. That means he's a descendant of Moses. See, this is a really sad end to this story because we're told this man's name. We're told something about him. We're told that this unknown Levite has a heritage, a very rich heritage a very important heritage. He also has a very important name and names were important this day, in that day and age. His name is Jonathan. And in the Hebrew, it comes from two words, one for Jehovah and the other one for given. And it literally means Jehovah has given. Let's think of that, about that for a reason, for a second. What do you think his parents meant when they gave this name to their son, their newborn son? Well, it obviously means God's given us a son. But I think there's far more to that. God had given them freedom from captivity. God had given them a land. God had given them his law. God had given them his sacrificial system. God had given him the Levitical priesthood to serve on their behalf. God had given them his promises. God had given and given and given and given. 
But here's this young Levite whose very name means Jehovah has given. And what's he done? See, here's Jonathan, this Levite, and he had taken liberties with his Levitical role. He had stepped outside of the bounds of his duty as a Levite, lived in places he shouldn't have lived, worshiped gods he shouldn't have worshiped, used his Levitical knowledge for falsehood, for idolatry. See, he stole from God. He robbed glory from God. Why? Because he worshiped false gods and he encouraged Micah to continue worshiping false gods. He encouraged the Danites to worship false gods. And anytime we worship anything or anyone other than God, we rob God of glory. Then finally, he hijacked, hijacked the hearts of all the Danites. See, he could have said to them, no, I'm not going, but he didn't. The truth is he should have told Micah, no, I will not be your priest. I will not help you worship false gods. But he was compli complacent and compliant all along the way. And he ended up le leading an entire tribe into a life of idolatry and a history of idolatry. So he's, his name is significant, but his heritage is significant. See, again, the Israelites, when they read this story, when they hear that he's a descendant of Moses, that would have shocked them. That would have appalled them. You mean you're a descendant of Moses himself and you're doing these kinds of things? Remember earlier I said, this was pervasive. When it says that everyone did what was right in his own eyes, it means everyone. Here's a descendant of Moses, the man who set the people free and led them all through the wilderness. His own descendant, is worshiping false gods. That's how bad it's gotten. And Israel is unhappy with their king, Jehovah. They're not satisfied with him. They're not willing to live according to his law, according to his sovereign will. They wanna do what's right in their eyes, not what's right in God's eyes. And see, they had the law. They knew the truth. They knew what God expected, but they had chosen to live the way they wanted to live. They're marked by ingratitude. That's one of the things that jumps out in the book of Judges to me. See, they're not happy with what God has. The Danites are not happy with the land allotted to them, so they choose somewhere else. The Levites not happy to live in one of the 48 cities where God had deemed it right to live. He wasn't content worshiping Yahweh and serving him. Micah wasn't content with Yahweh. He wasn't content living in a home with a mother who had obviously a lot of wealth. He wanted to take it from her. Ingratitude. Unsatisfied with the blessings of God. We also see that these people are, are characterized by unfaithfulness. Again, that just keeps jumping out as we go through this book and as we end in these last five chapters, unfaithfulness over and over again unfaithful to, <coughs> excuse me, a faithful God, unwilling to accept his blessings for what they were. And then finally, they were addicted to what? Disobedience. If you think about it, we see in the story of Micah, we see in the story of the Danites, and we've seen it with the judges and the people of Israel all throughout these chapters, that they are addicted to disobedience. They can't stop disobeying, disobeying, doing what they want to do. And it is so easy for every one of us, even as Christ followers, as sons of God, as followers of Jesus Christ, we can just as easily become disobedient and we can become addicted to doing what we want to do. And sometimes we convince ourselves we're, that we're doing the right thing, but we got to stop. And we got to ask, Lord, is this what you would have me do? Is this within your will? Is this what you have for me? And again, we have to go back and understand the only way to know God's will is to know God's word where he reveals himself to us and to allow his Holy Spirit to guide us and to direct us and to convict us and to teach us. But we have to listen and we have to obey. These people were prone. They're prone to godlessness. They were Godless. They lived their lives as if God didn't exist. Micah did. 
The Levite did. His mother did. The Danites did. And generations of Danites to come and Israelites to come would do the same thing. And guess what? That same thing happens today where we can become prone to godlessness, living as if God doesn't exist. But guys, I hope as you go through this period of time, this very rough period of time in our nation, as we wonder what's gonna happen next, that you would remember that we serve a faithful God. He has not left us. He has not abandoned us. He has not checked out on us. He is fully in charge. He is fully in control. He knows what's going on and he's calling us to rest in him, to trust him in him. And what's amazing is so many of the gods that we lean on, our money, our livelihood, our health, our freedom are being taken away. And what we're left to lean on is God. And that's exactly where he wants us to be, that we would not live godless, but godly as we lean on him. See, the one thing that jumps out at me the Danites, the Levite, and Micah were all going to suffer the consequences. But you know what? So will we. Anytime we step out of the will of God, anytime we decide to do things our way, we will suffer the consequences. Doesn't mean that God's going to leave us. It doesn't mean that God's going to abandon us. It doesn't mean that we're going to lose our salvation. But if you want to do what's right in your eyes and do what's evil in God's eyes, you will always suffer the consequences. And yet God faithfully wants to bless you if you'll just obey him, if you'll serve him, if you'll worship him. So we're gonna end with our discussion questions. And I know it's really hard for you guys to get together. I'd encourage you to call each other. Uh, hey, do these discussion questions with your own family. Watch the video together. But talk about these questions and here they are. As God's chosen people, what are some ways in which our lives can be marked by ingratitude, characterized by unfaithfulness, addicted to disobedience and prone to godlessness. And if you have any trouble answering this question, call me, I'll help you out. But you shouldn't, because we all do these things. What do they look like in your life? Secondly, of all the bad decisions made in this story, and there are a plethora of them, which ones or one stands out to you and why? Which one resonates with you? Is it the dishonesty of Micah? Is it the kind of deceit of his mother? dedicating 1,100 pieces of silver to God, but only giving 200 of it to have an idol made? Which one resonates with you? And then go back and read Exodus 19, verses five through six. I want you to discuss the ways in which Israel failed to live up to their calling. See, they're God's chosen people. They're his special possession. How did they fail to live up to that? And as you think about that, think about your own life. What are some ways in which you and I even right now are failing to live up to our identity as sons of God, join heirs with Jesus Christ, a child of the kingdom and an inheritor of everything that belongs to Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these men. I thank you for this story. I thank you for this lesson. I thank you, Father, that we can go back and look at these stories from the Old Testament and they are rich and they are alive because your word is rich and alive. Father, I pray that we would understand that during these days when so much is uncertain, we can trust in you, we can lean on you, that you are a faithful God, you are a loving God, you're a caring God, and you are an omnipotent God, all powerful. And there is no reason that we need to fear. But Father, how easy it is even now to lose our faith, to live as if you don't exist, to let fear overtake us, to let doubts overwhelm us, would you remind us, Father, that we can trust in you? And would you call each one of us, Father, to, be to become faithful and godly, not godless? Thank you for these men. Thank you for this time we've had together. And would you use this and multiply it and even bring men who aren't part of this study to watch this with their families, that, Father, they could hear the story found in chapter 17 and 18 of the book of Judges. And I pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Have a great day.